So Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 to 10. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and of understanding. The spirit of counsel and of power. The spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears. But with righteousness, he will judge the needy. With justice, he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt and faithfulness the sash round his waist. The wolf will live with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf and the lion and the yearling together. And a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear. Their young will lie down together. And the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the hole of the cobra. And the young child put his hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain. For the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. In that day, the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the peoples. The nations will rally to him, and his place of rest will be glorious. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. So writes John in his first letter. As he reflects on the blessing of being adopted into God's family, he bursts out in praise. How great is the Father's love for us. What a blessing. What a privilege to be called a child of God. But why? Throughout the New Testament, Christians are described as those who have been adopted into God's family through Jesus, and it's always presented as a wonderful gift and a privilege. Why is that? We might think, well, isn't it obvious? In our world, when a child is adopted, that child is usually moving from a situation where they're in some kind of danger or instability to a home where they will be welcomed and safe. And that's what's happened to Christian people. When we trusted in Jesus, we were moved from being in very great spiritual danger to a place of safety. We've gone from being lost, hopeless, helpless, enslaved, and under God's judgment, to being found, rescued, forgiven, redeemed from slavery to sin, and showered with God's grace. That's what we've seen over the past few weeks, isn't it? We've spent the last three weeks meditating on Paul's claim in Romans 1 that when Jesus was raised from the dead, he was declared with power to be the Son of God. We've looked back over what that title means in the rest of the Bible by considering others who are called the Son of God in the Old Testament. In week one, we thought about Adam, the Son of God. We considered that being a Son of God meant being created in God's image, resembling God and representing him to the world sharing his rule, being crowned with glory and honor as those tasked with stewarding God's creation. We lost that privilege through sin, and yet when Christ was raised from the dead, he was declared to be a second Adam, the head of a new humanity, 
And so in Christ, our true humanity is restored. We can learn what it means to be truly human again. And we can look forward to a new creation where we will finally be able to exercise that role that we were given in the beginning. In week two, we thought about Israel, the Son of God. We saw there that Israel was re- were redeemed from slavery to a cruel taskmaster and service to false gods to the privilege of sonship. Restored to worship and serve God as they were always meant to do. We saw like everyone else, they failed to do that, but Christ succeeded. So when Christ was raised from the dead, he was declared to be the true Israel, the true people of God the truly mature son who always obeyed his father in confident joy. And so in Christ, true redemption is offered, freedom from slavery to sin, and the promise of maturity and growth in confident, joyful obedience and a welcome home. And in week three, through the medium of chocolate and a man in a lion suit, we thought about David, the son of God. We heard the precious promise of a shepherd king who would rule over the whole world forever, defeating his people's enemies, granting them (coughs) security and prosperity. Once again, we saw David's failure and Christ's success. So when Christ was raised from the dead, he was declared to be the true David, the forever shepherd king, the one who would put every enemy under his feet, including sin and death. (coughs) And so in Christ, true citizenship is offered. A place in the new Jerusalem, the heavenly Zion, and the promise of total security and prosperity in the new creation. So being adopted, being called a son or daughter of God in Jesus, the son of God, it's a pretty amazing privilege, isn't it? And yet we have not fully seen why it's so good to be adopted into God's family. As I said at the beginning of this series, however good you think Jesus is, he is better than that. So in our final talk in the series, we're going to take another long look at Jesus, the Son of God, and consider once again how good it is to be called children of God. My hope and prayer today is that if you are a Christian, your mind will be stretched and your heart will be warmed, so you will know and love Jesus better. And if you're not a Christian, that you become one. We're going to spend the first uh, half of our time, more than half really, together in the passage we just heard read and from Isaiah 11, one of the greatest descriptions in the Bible of the Son of God. The passage comes in the context of the failure of the kings of Israel. They'd completely lost faith in God, they turned to idolatry along with the rest of the people, and when threatened with invasion from other nations, which if you remember from Hosea was one of the covenant curses that God swore he would bring upon Israel if they turned away from him. When threatened with that, instead of repenting and seeking the Lord, they made political alliances with their enemies, with Egypt and Assyria, in hope of sort of buying them off and keeping themselves safe. Well, the result was disaster. Isaiah prophesied the exile and almost complete destruction of the people. In chapter 6 and again in chapter 9, God says that his judgment is going to sweep through Israel like a fire ravaging a forest, burning everything down until all that's left is a blackened stump. And yet God's grace continues. His commitment to his promises continue. Look at verse 1. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. From the middle of the burnt-out forest, a single sapling begins to grow. Out of the chaos of judgment, the curse of decreation, new life dawns with the promise of fruit, a new and flourishing creation. And because Isaiah says the shoot comes out from the stump of Jesse, who is David's father, we know we're looking at a new David. We're looking at the fulfillment of 2 Samuel 7, the promised shepherd king, the true son of God. So let's look at this prophetic picture of Jesus and see what we see. First, we see the spirit-filled son of God. Read with me from verse 2. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and of power, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. You may know that in the Old Testament, uh, many people were endowed with the Spirit of God for certain particular tasks and roles. Some were given the Spirit to be able to do practical things like metalwork in the building of the temple. 
Others were given the Spirit for a particular role, to be a prophet or a priest or a judge or a king. But there was always a sort of provisional, temporary aspect to that gift. The Spirit could empower someone for a task, but the Spirit could also leave a person. The Holy Spirit left Saul when Saul disobeyed God. When David sinned with Bathsheba, he pleaded with God in Psalm 51 that he would not take his Holy Spirit from him. God cannot dwell with sinners, and so his Holy Spirit cannot abide permanently with sinful people. But look at the difference here. The Spirit of the Lord will rest upon this figure. There is a fullness and a permanence here. The Spirit is at home with this son of Jesse. Do you remember when, the, when Jesus was baptized, that the Spirit of God came down like a dove and rested upon him? And John the Baptist was told that when he saw the Spirit of God come down and remain upon someone, that man would be the Son of God. Jesus is the one on whom the Spirit rests, the one who is at home with God, who doesn't resist the Spirit, who didn't sin and threaten the Spirit's presence with him. He's the Spirit-filled Son of God. But what does that mean? Well, Isaiah tells us the Spirit grants this Son of God three sets of gifts. First, he has wisdom and understanding. This is the language of government. This is what King Solomon asked for when he was about to ascend the throne. It's what rulers need. The wisdom to see things clearly. The understanding to make the right call and come to the right judgment. Second, he has counsel and power. And that's the language of conquest. This is what King David had in abundant measure, the skill to come up with the right plan to defeat an enemy and the power to execute it. It's what a king needs to protect his people from enemies and keep them safe. Third, he has knowledge and fear of the Lord. This is the language of spiritual leadership. In Deuteronomy 17, we learn that the kings of Israel were required to make for themselves a copy of the law and meditate on it day and night so that they might walk in God's ways and become an example for others to follow. If a leader gets the big calls right and keeps his people safe, but is himself a bad example, he will lead his people astray. They may have strong borders, but there will be a rotting poison at the heart of the kingdom which will eventually lead to its destruction. But that is not what we see in this Son of God. This Son of God knows God and fears Him. In fact, verse 3, He delights to fear Him. He's not in power to get something for Himself. He's not using God's name to get what He really wants. Obeying God is what He really wants. As Jesus would later say, doing His Father's will is like food to Him. It's His delight and his nourishment. For him, obedience is not something he has to do in order to get what he really wants. It's not something he's forced to do when what he really wants to do is sin. No, it's something he gets to do. He loves God as a mature son loves his father, and so he wants to do what pleases his father, not in hope of a reward like the older son in Jesus' parable, but because pleasing his father is its own reward for him. In other words, we see in this spirit-filled Son of God something we've never seen in our world and something only glimpsed in part in Israel. The might of David, the wisdom of Solomon, and the holiness of God himself, guide, guardian, and example rolled into one beautiful human package. And so he can bring about perfect justice. Look at the second half of verse 3. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes, or decide by what he hears with his ears, but with righteousness he will judge the needy. With justice he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt, and faithfulness the sash round his waist. Kind of escaped your notice that ours is a world which is longing and searching for justice. People denounce wokery and cancel culture, but we have to acknowledge that behind those things is a desire for the world to be as it should be, where evil is punished and good is rewarded. The problem, of course, is that we don't know what justice should look like. 
without the knowledge of how the world ought to work. People come up with their own interpretations and ideas and judge others for not conforming to them. We make ourselves God and we cast ourselves as judge, jury, and executioner, and so justice is not done. Innocent people are punished because they do not conform to the latest ideas. Meanwhile, guilty people get away with crimes because they manage to hide it. All we can do as sinful human beings trying to govern the world without God is judged by what we see with our eyes and what we hear with our ears. We only have people's testimony to go on, but people can lie, can't they? People can hide their true motives and people can make honest mistakes. And we only have our ideas of right and wrong to judge by. And our hearts are full of idolatry and deceitful above all things. And the result is chaos. And justice seems further away than ever. Yet this man has none of those failings. He isn't swayed by appearances or clever sounding arguments. He's not biased towards rich or powerful people, nor actually is he biased towards poor and needy people, nor towards those who simply make the most noise on social media. He judges with righteousness. He gives precisely the right judgments at precisely the right time, according to God's own design for his world and for his people. In John 2, 25, we read that Jesus did not need to hear a man's testimony because he knew what was in a man. He can read the secret intentions of our hearts and discern every mixed motive. He knows the difference between a lie and an honest mistake. He sees the truth about everyone, even that which is hidden from everybody else. And so he brings about effortless divine justice. He simply speaks a word, verse 4, and the wicked are destroyed. Again, we see people trying to do that in our world, don't we? to take people down with our words, to banish people from our sight because they're out of step with what we currently believe is right, what we currently think of as justice. But that is not our right. And we often target the wrong people and let the real evildoers go unpunished. Not so with this son of God. Verse five, righteousness will be his belt. So a strange image, isn't it? Righteousness being a belt. But the idea, I think, is that everything this man does is held together and tied together with righteousness. Just like a belt holds everything together, binds the clothes to a person so they don't fall down. So this man's kingdom and rule is held together with perfect fairness and justice and godliness and holiness. It's said uh, that every political career ends in failure. We've seen a lot of that in recent weeks, haven't we? The wrong decision is made, or the character flaws become too obvious to ignore, or the hidden secrets are revealed. Our leaders fail us, and that's because they are us. They're sinners like you and me. Without righteousness to bind everything together, things fall apart. And yet this man can rule forever. He must rule forever. He's exactly what we need. He's the spirit-filled son of God. So what happens when this man ascends the throne while well, the spirit-filled sons of God, son of God brings about a restored new creation? Look at verse 6. The wolf will live with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear, their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the hole of the cobra, and the young child put his hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Now that is a campaign promise, isn't it? We've recently heard uh, Keir Starmer's five missions for the country and Rishi Sunak's five pledges, and some of them are pretty ambitious. But look at this. Forget about making Britain a clean energy superpower. This is total ecological transformation. Predator lying down with prey. Lions, remember, if you were here last week, lions are pretty scary. Uh, Becoming herbivores overnight. And forget NHS waiting lists falling. This is universal health for free forever. Little toddlers can play with snakes without fear of being hurt. And to borrow a political slogan from the past, forget tough on crime, tough on the causes of crime. Here is a complete end to sin. 
Verse 9, no one will harm or destroy. I'd vote for him, but this is a political manifesto that no one would dare to offer, is it? Isn't it? Because this is a return to the Garden of Eden. This is a fulfillment of the mandate given to Adam at the beginning to be fruitful and multiply, to rule over every creature in the world. Did you notice in verse 6 that even a little child can exercise leadership authority over wolves and leopards as well as over sheep and goats? Did you notice too that in verse 8, serpents hold no danger? In fact, this is better than a return to the garden, because here there is no threat. No threat from the outside. Here, snakes are not venomous tempters. They're toothless pets. And no threat from the inside either. No one will harm or destroy. This is a kingdom of transformed people who follow the example of their king. They delight in the fear of the Lord, and so they are fit to dwell on his holy mountain, verse 9. Something that David says in Psalm 24 is only available to those who have clean hands and a pure heart. A transformed people living in a renewed earth, and so verse 9, this renewed earth is full of the knowledge of the Lord. That was the goal of that command to Adam and Eve in the beginning, to be fruitful and multiply. The point was that they, made in the image of God, would spread God's image to every corner of the earth, to extend his gracious rule to every square inch of creation. And here, the second Adam, the spirit-filled son of God, fulfills the task. The whole earth is going to be full with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. But it's not just Adam's job that he does, it's Israel's job as well. Look at verse 10. In that day, the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the peoples. The nations will rally to him and his place of rest will be glorious. Let's just pause to note something a bit strange. This man is called the shoot of Jesse, Jesse's descendant in verse 1, and the root of Jesse, Jesse's ancestor in verse 10. He comes from Jesse, but also Jesse comes from him. That's a puzzle. That's a puzzle in the Old Testament that Jesus himself put to the Pharisees in Matthew 22. How can the Christ, the son of David, also be called the Lord of David? They didn't know the answer. Because they had yet to realize that this son of God was also God the Son. The eternal creator of Jesse, born as a man in Jesse's line, both Jesse's root and Jesse's shoot. And here, this man does what Israel was always meant to do. Israel was brought into the promised land, into God's rest, with the goal that they would be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, calling the other nations back to the worship of God, to rest with him by showing them how good and glorious it is to walk in his ways. Of course, they failed to do that. They became just like the other nations in their worship of idols, and eventually they were just assimilated back into the nations. But this son of God does Israel's job perfectly. He is a banner. In our day, perhaps we'd say a flashing neon light, drawing the nations back to God, back to right relationship with him, back to rest in his presence, the goal of creation. Jesus fulfilled this in the most extraordinary way. Towards the end of his life, a group of Greeks came to the disciples and said that they too wanted to see Jesus. The nations, you see, had heard of the power and compassion of the Spirit-filled Son of God, and they wanted to know more. They wanted to meet him. Perhaps they wanted to follow him and to worship him. And Jesus said this, the verses will come on the screen. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out, but I, when I'm lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. On the cross, Jesus was lifted up from the earth, raised as a banner, that flashing neon sign that said to people from every nation, now is the time to come. You Greeks, you Frenchmen, you Canadians, you Lancastrians, you can come. Now the lies of Satan, the prince of this world, are proved untrue and his purpose is thwarted. Now the true Israel is here, promising forgiveness of sins, healing from idolatry, and rest in God's presence. As verse 10 says, his place of rest is going to be glorious. 
and you can come. At the beginning of the series, I promised you a bigger vision of Jesus. Can you see it? We often talk about Jesus being our personal saviour. And isn't that wonderfully true? He is our personal saviour. Praise God. But if our view of Jesus is of someone who merely forgives my sins and makes me right with God, then that's not enough. He is the new Adam bringing in a restored new creation. He's the new Israel, calling every nation back to God's worship. He is the new David, ruling over a perfected world forever. He's doing something much bigger and grander than saving a few isolated individuals from, from judgment. He's remaking a broken world. As Paul says in Colossians, everything is created by Jesus and for Jesus. And in his death and resurrection, he's reconciling the whole lot back to him. This is a project on a universal, on a cosmic scale. The spirit-filled son of God is bringing about a restored new creation. So here's a question for us. Where do we fit in? If you've trusted in Jesus today, you've been called back to worship God by the banner of the cross. You've been set on a path which ends here in this gloriously restored new creation. But what does that make us? Remember the parable of the prodigal son that we looked at a few weeks ago? When he came to his senses and set off on a path back to his father, all he could hope for was to be made like one of the father's hired men. A servant, a slave, who just so happened to live in the Father's house and under the Father's protection. And we've got to admit, that would be enough, wouldn't it, for us? That would be much more than we could hope for and much more than we deserve just to be a slave in his house. But the grace of Jesus is greater than that. In Christ we are counted as sons of God. Turn with me, please, to Romans 8. Page numbers will be on the screen. Page 1135, 1134, actually, 1134. We don't have time to do uh, justice to this astonishing chapter of the Bible. But I want us to see how Paul describes Christians in this passage. He calls us spirit-filled sons of God. Throughout these central chapters of Romans, Paul is grappling with a tension that all Christians feel. We are convinced as Christian people that Christ has died and has risen for us. We're sure of forgiveness and future hope. And yet we still live in a broken and fallen world. In bodies that are dying and decaying and still sinful. And it can be difficult to believe sometimes that anything has changed, can't it? It can be difficult to believe that the new creation really is coming. With that in mind... Read with me from verse 9 of chapter 8. You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit, if the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin, yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. In Isaiah 11, we saw that the spirit rested on Jesus. There was a permanence and a fullness to the spirit's presence with the son of Jesse. Now, do you see that same permanence and fullness here in Romans 8? The Spirit of God lives in you. He says it three times in two verses. The Spirit of God lives in you. Even as we experience life in a deathly body, even as we continue to sin, yet, verse 10, our spirit is alive because of righteousness. And as the rest of Romans makes very, very clear, that's not our righteousness. It's not our good deeds and our obedience which makes our spirit alive. No, it's Christ's righteousness. His good works offered in our place. His obedient death offered in our place. Christ fastens his belt of righteousness around us too. He gives us clean hands and a pure heart. Which means that God's spirit can now fully fully and finally take up residence in the hearts of believers without fear and without reservation. 
And that means, as we read from verse 12, that we have new freedom. Verse 12. Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation, but it's not to the sinful nature to live according to it. For if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. There is that language of freedom from slavery that we looked at a couple of weeks ago. We used to be under the control of the sinful nature. We couldn't help sinning. We had an obligation to sin. But now we have a new master. The same spirit who led Christ in wisdom and counsel and the fear of the Lord now leads us. That doesn't mean we instantly become sinless. But it means that we gradually become Christ-like. Learning to say no to our old slave driver sin and to say yes to walking in the footsteps of our king. So then what are we? What is our identity? Who are we? We were slaves to sin. Are we now merely slaves to Christ? We are his servants. We are his subjects. He is our king. Is that all that can be said about us? Well, look at verse 15. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. We are much more than servants and slaves. We are sons and daughters. That same Spirit who remained on Christ remains with us, and testifies to us that we are loved and adopted. Like the prodigal son who could barely get his apology out. He only got halfway through it, didn't he, in Luke 15, before the father said, shut up, threw the best robe on him, and ushered him back into the family home for a party. There is welcome and security and acceptance here, like with the adopted child who has come from a broken and abusive family to find a home with loving parents. And yet, do you see there's an even greater blessing here? An even greater privilege? We are described, verse 17, as co-heirs with Christ. He is the Son of God, and we as sons of God, whether you're a male or female, stand to inherit just as he does. I wonder uh, if you have siblings, whether you ever fear that you're not the favorite. Uh, Like when I went to visit my parents and asked for the Wi-Fi password and was told it was my younger brother's name and date of birth. (laughs) True story. Uh, I'm sure they love me. Uh, How many novels and films have traded on the moment when the father's will is read out and we learn that one son inherits everything and the other son has been completely disinherited? Our father God is not like that. He does not show partiality. He does not play favorites. And that extends, get this, that extends to how he treats his own family. Christ is the heir because he is the son. Yet those who trust in him are also sons and therefore also heirs. Yet what does Christ stand to inherit? Remember Isaiah 11, a whole restored new creation, a new world, free of suffering and sin, free of death and pain, waiting for a new humanity to come and work it and enjoy it and cause it to flourish. It belongs to Christ as his inheritance, but because we're in the same family and God doesn't play favorites, we are co-heirs with him. It belongs to us too. And so just as a spirit-filled son of God brings about a new creation, so we spirit-filled sons and daughters of God await a restored new creation. In verse 15, we are told that those who have the Spirit of God can, just as Christ did, cry out, Abba, Father. We can address God as our Father, with all the intimacy and fearlessness of a little child with their dad. But remember, when when did Jesus cry out, Abba, Father? It was in the Garden of Gethsemane. It was when when he was about to suffer the most terrible affliction imaginable. 
It was when he was tempted to refuse the cross, which would be such an agony to him. It was when he needed strength to obey in the middle of excruciating pain. In the midst of suffering and temptation, he cried out, Abba, Father, he cried out for his Father's help. And that is Paul's point. The wonderful vision of Isaiah 11, the final glorious rest of the new creation. Well, it still lies in our future, doesn't it? While we wait, we find ourselves in the midst of suffering, temptation, frustration, pain, and sin. We cry out, Abba, Father, because life is hard. So what do we need to know? Look at verse 18. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself would be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth, right up to the present time. One day soon... This frustrated creation will be set free from bondage. It will come out of slavery, the slavery of being under God's curse, the slavery of not being able to flourish because it is ruled over by sinful humans like us. Creation awaits its rightful master. Verse 19, the whole world is waiting for the sons of God to be revealed. This is the design of God, that his world will be ruled by those in God's image. Christ is the first fruits of that design, the spirit-filled Son of God, but he is the first of many. When Christ is revealed, so his brothers and sisters will be revealed too. And at that point, the world will be put right again. Creation will once again be put under the rule of a new humanity who will be able to tell the wolf to stop eating the lamb, who will be able to command the serpent not to harm the child. We're looking forward to that, and so is the whole of creation. And it will happen. How do we know? Because Christ is risen from the dead. By the spirit of holiness, he has been declared to be the son of God with power. And those who have that same spirit have that same declaration spoken over their lives. And one day we too, along with the rest of creation, will rise again with him to a new life. But the future holds more in store than just an end to suffering. We, of course, long for the day where there's no more war, no more pain, no more distress and anguish, no more poverty, no more sickness. But that's not the only promise of the new creation. Look at verse 23. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. Last Friday, I had a really good day. Uh, I'd spent the day with my sons watching cricket, and uh, we met up with Sean and Hannah, my wife and daughter, for meatballs at Ikea. Now, that might not be your idea of a good day. Uh, That's fine. Um, But that actually wasn't why it was so good. The the reason why it's such a good day is that I basically behaved myself nearly all day. Uh, I got up early, having a good time reading the Bible and praying. While we were out, I didn't do my usual thing of being grumpy and generally a bit irritable. I think I even paid attention to my wife in Ikea. (laughs) It's all fairly miraculous. And as we drove home, I thought to myself, it's so annoying that I'm going to sin again. It's so annoying. It's so frustrating. Life is so much better when I behave even the tiniest bit like Jesus. Why can't I do it all the time? Sin is so illogical, isn't it? And so counterproductive and so misery-inducing. Why do I keep doing it? And yet I do it. And no matter how good a day I have today, I'll probably mess it up tomorrow. I am in Christ, a mature son of God, and yet in my wretched body I am a spoilt, stubborn, rebellious toddler. Well, that's the true joy of the new creation we're awaiting, the redemption of our bodies, final freedom from the misery of sin, Adoption as sons, the freedom to enjoy righteousness and rule forever in a gloriously free new creation. That is where the world is heading. 
And so as we conclude this talk and this short series, I just want to leave you with one question. Who are you? What is your identity? Where is it located? Who are you? The resurrection of Jesus from the dead offers us a new identity. Jesus has been declared with power to be the Son of God, the second Adam, the true Israel, the forever David, and he invites all of us to find our identity in him, to put our trust in him, in him alone, and to therefore to be declared sons and daughters of God ourselves, to gain a new identity as settled members of God's family, Christ's brothers and sisters, heirs with him of the new creation, filled with his spirit. And I want to say that if if that is not your primary identity, then you're missing out today. You see, we can find our identity in all sorts of things, can't we? We can find it in our personality. I'm a a go-getter. I'm a people person. I'm a loser. We can find it in our gifts. I'm clever. I'm funny. I'm useless. We can find it in our profession. I'm an accountant, I'm a stay-at-home mum, I'm unemployable. We can find it in our sexuality, in our gender, in our politics, in our interests. We can find it in our family or our friendship groups. We can find it in our works. I'm a good person, I'm a kind person, I'm a religious person, I'm a bad person. We can find it, and this is perhaps a particular temptation for us as Christian people, in our work for God. I'm active in gospel ministry. I'm a pastor. I'm trying to reach my friends for Jesus. I believe all the right things. What happens when we place our primary identity in something other than Jesus, even in something really good like family or work or gospel ministry? We will find our identity is a very fragile and unsettled thing. If we root our identity in who we are in something in this world, in ourselves or in our activity or in our good works or in our correct faith, then we will constantly have a need to prove ourselves to be worthy. We'll have to live up to our gifts, fulfill our potential, be the best version of ourselves, outdo other people in our activism. We will never be able to rest because our identity, our joy, our hope depends on something in me or in this fragile or broken world. We will lash out at anyone who, anything who threatens our identity and we will end up idolizing this creation instead of worshipping God's Son. All because we need to prove ourselves to be the kind of person the world expects us to be or the kind of person I want to be or even the kind of person I think God wants me to be. But adopted children don't need to prove themselves. They've already been chosen. They've found a home where they're accepted. And in this case, we're accepted on the merits of another. We're sons and daughters because of our older brother, because of his righteousness, his death in our place, his resurrection, which guarantees our own. If you've never put your trust in Jesus before, today would be an excellent day to do it. And if you have, then I hope you have a bigger view of him than you had before. I hope you realize he can take more of your trust He can bear more of your weight. His resting place is glorious. He has been declared with power to be the son of God. You can put everything in the hands of your older brother. Let me finish with these words again from 1 John 3 verse 1. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for Jesus. Thank you that he is the spirit-filled son of God. Thank you that his belt is righteousness. Thank you that he always did what was right and good in your sight. Thank you that he died in our place and thank you that he rose to be the ruler of the new creation. Thank you that you have included us in your family, that you've adopted us and welcomed us 
if we're trusting in Jesus today. Father, I pray for those in this room who have not yet trusted in Jesus. Please, would you give them eyes to see who Jesus is and who they are? And please, would they trust in him fully with all their heart? And we pray that for all of us too. Please keep us from the temptation of finding our identity and our meaning in the things of this world or even the things that we do for you. Rather, help us put all our weight and all our trust and all our hope on the person of Jesus Christ, on his death and resurrection. And may we grow to be more like him day by day by your spirit. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.